Then next Lord's Day, uh, the preacher, both at the morning and evening service here, will be the Reverend Malcolm Ball. And then just for your information, in case you haven't already heard, um, and for your prayerful uh, consideration, uh, the Reverend David Sutherland, who had received the call to Newton Ards, has indicated that he has accepted that call, and he'll be leaving Ballylagan and in due course moving to Newton Ards. So we thank God for giving uh, David and Ruth uh, clarity uh, in relation to how they should respond to that call, and we pray for God's blessing upon his future ministry. We're here to worship God. The scriptures tell us that from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. And we worship God this evening as we sing praise together from our first psalm, which is 145. We're singing from the second version of the psalm, another of the same. And we're going to sing the first seven verses of this psalm to tune number 177. Psalm 145, the second version, stanzas 1 to 7. O Lord, thou art my God and King. Thee will I magnify and praise. I will thee bless and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. We sing these words in praise to God as we remain seated, and then we will stand as we come to God in prayer. Let us worship God together. Oh, Lord, and I, thy 
consciousness relate. Let's stand as we pray. Our Father and our God, we draw near to you, Lord God, in this the evening of your day. We look back with thankfulness, Lord, for all that we have already enjoyed. We praise you for fellowship this morning with yourself, with our fellow believers, for the privilege of being able to come and to bring to you worship that is due to you and to you alone. We thank you, O God, for the quietness of the Sabbath, for the restfulness of it, for the opportunity to take time to focus more upon the things of eternity, to feed our souls upon good things from your word. For all of this, Lord, we bless you. And you have gathered us together again, Lord, on this evening to come and to worship you. We thank you, gracious Spirit, for giving us the desire to be here. And Lord God, we do pray that as the day of the Lord begins to draw to a close, that once again you would be pleased to be with us. Lord, you yourself have given us your promise, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. You have said, seek ye my face, and our hearts reply as your face, Lord, we will seek. Father, we thank you for these words of praise that we have been singing. We own you and confess you to be our God and our King. We magnify and praise your name. We think of your wondrous works, works of creation, and the wonderful work of redemption. And for these things, O oh God, we lift up our hearts to you, acknowledging that you are the ultimate source of all blessing. From you comes every good and perfect gift. In the hand, in your hand is the breath of every living creature. And so, Father, for the gift of life and for the precious gift of eternal life, we give you thanks this evening. Heavenly Father, as we draw near to you tonight, we pray that you would once again give us the help we need to worship you in a way that is pleasing and acceptable. We pray, Lord God, that you would give us the ability to concentrate as we come to study your word. And we ask you, gracious Spirit, to teach us. You have been sent to lead us into truth, and we pray that you would indeed do so. We pray for our fellow believers we ask your blessing, Lord God, upon the other congregations in our denomination. We thank you for the family of believers to which we belong and the branch of the church in your kingdom in which you've placed us. We pray for those congregations that are vacant and are still seeking a pastor. Lord, we as a congregation know what that's like. And we pray that you would grant to those congregations to their interim moderators, to their elders, a sense, Lord God, of your guidance, and that there would be considerable unity of mind among the people as to the way forward. Guide them, Lord, not only in respect of whom they should call, but also when that call should be made. We give you thanks for answering prayer for the Reverend David Sutherland and his family for moving them to accept the call to Newton Ards. We pray, Lord God, that just as you have greatly used David in the ministry in Ballylagan, so you will also use him thus in the ministry in Newton Ards. We pray that the folks in Ballylagan will be accepting of and submissive to your will and that they will send David to this new sphere of ministry with joy for all that they have enjoyed under his ministry these last years. We pray also, Father, for our missionaries. We thank you for the little family in uh, Nantes and for the Burkholz in Spain. And we pray, Lord God, that each of them in their separate locations may be encouraged in their work, may be enjoying serving you there, and may have the great joy of seeing the kingdom of God growing and extending 
as people are brought in under the sound of the gospel and brought to faith. We do pray, Lord God, for the upcoming visit of members of the Spanish session to go and see Isaac and Rachel and the family. Lord, may this prove to be pastorally beneficial to that family, profitable to the overall work, and helpful with regards to the way forward in relation to the call that has been issued from the congregation in Seville. Lord, we look to you to bring answers to all these prayers. Above all, we desire to see your kingdom growing all over the world. And Lord, we pray that it would happen in our own land. Lord, we long to see days when our congregations are filled, our church buildings are filled, and people have a real interest in and concern for the things of God. Lord, only you can do this, and we pray that you would do so. Lord, forgive us of our sins again, we pray. Even on this holy day that you've set apart, we have sinned against you. Cleanse us afresh. Thank you, Lord, that there is a way by which our ongoing sins can be cleansed, even through the blood of Christ shed at Calvary. It is in Jesus' name that we bring these prayers to you. Amen. So we turn to the Gospel of Matthew, please. The Gospel of Matthew and chapter 25. We're going to begin reading at verse number 14. Matthew chapter 25 and beginning at verse number 14. The overall context of these words are Jesus is giving parabolic teaching about the end times. And in verse 14 and following we have what is known as the parable of the talents. Let us hear the word of God. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained besides them five talents more. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put the money, my money to the exchangers, 
And then, at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him. Give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So reads God's word. And we pray his blessing upon it. We turn again to our psalm books. This time to the words of the 63rd psalm. Psalm 63. I'm going to sing stanzas 1 to 8. And the tune to which we sing is number 134. 134. Lord thee, my God, I'll early seek. My soul doth thirst for thee. My flesh longs in a dry parched land wherein no waters be, that I thy power may behold, and brightness of thy face, as I have seen thee heretofore within thy holy place, since better is thy love than life. That's some statement, isn't it? Better is thy love than life itself. How true that is for those of us who are God's people. My lips the praise shall give. We sing stanzas one to eight, and after this we will stand as we once again pray for God's blessing on the preaching of the word. Let us worship God. Oh, uh-huh. 
Let's stand pray, please. <clears throat> Father, we give you thanks for these glorious psalms that we can sing. Words, Lord, that have been sung down through the centuries of the history of your people. And words, Lord God, that we sing from our hearts. Since better is thy love than life, my lips thee praise shall give. We do praise you this evening, Father, for who you are in yourself and for all that you have done for sinners like us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Father, as we come to study your truth, we pray that you would give us understanding, that the Holy Spirit would grant liberty in the preaching of the word, that it would give us humility of heart to accept the word, and Lord, that we would receive it not as the word of man, but as the word of the living God. Help us, Lord, to be not like the person who looks into a mirror and sees himself and then goes away and does nothing about it. But rather, Lord, help us to be not only hearers, but also doers of your word for the glory of your great name. We pray through Christ our Lord and Saviour. Amen. So this evening we bring to a conclusion the uh, short series of studies that I've been undertaking when I've been preaching here on uh, different pictures or portraits that we have of a Christian in the Word of God, words that are used to describe a Christian. This morning we were thinking about uh, an ambassador, and this evening, to bring this to a close, we're going to think about the Christian as a steward, as a steward. Uh, the Christian is described in this way in several places in the New Testament. For example, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, uh, the apostle writing there says that uh, as each has received gifts, as every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of of God. And then if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2, you will see that Paul also uses this uh, description of a Christian. Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. The Lord Jesus also used this metaphor to refer to Christians in a number of his parables. Uh, he told the parable of the unjust steward in Luke 16. Uh, we read from Matthew 25 where we have the parable of the talents and although the word servants used there, it is the idea of a steward as we'll see. And also the same can be said of the parable of the pounds in Luke chapter 19. So it's this picture of the Christian as a steward that we want to turn our thoughts to this evening. And I want to approach this by asking various questions. And I suppose the first question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is a steward? What is a steward? The fact is that the concept of stewardship is not as familiar to us today as it perhaps was in previous generations. And so it's important to take a few minutes to try to understand who a steward was and what the steward was supposed to do. I don't know how many of you are interested in etymology. And maybe some of you are thinking to yourselves, well, if I knew what etymology was, I might be interested in it. Um, etymology is the study of words. And it's the study of words with a view to trying to discover how they originated and what they actually mean. And when you dig into the word steward, it's very interesting. It comes from the Middle English word stiward, S-T-I-W-A-R-D. And that's an amalgamation of two words, the word sty and the word ward. Now the word sty was a shortened form of an old word stig. And the stig was a word for a house. I think the only context in which the word sty, the shortened form of stig, 
is used today for a house is a pig sty. A house for pigs, literally. So a sty was the word for a house. And the word ward meant to guard or to take care of. Where do you go when you go into hospital? You go into a ward. It's no coincidence that it's called a ward. A ward is somewhere or something where one cares for someone else. So a sty ward, or the I was changed to an E eventually, and you get the word steward, was someone who was entrusted with the responsibility of looking after and caring for a household. So here you have a rich family. They have a big house. Uh, they're very well to do. They don't want to be bothered with having to spend time doing mundane things like cooking food and cleaning and ordering in the groceries and making sure that there's enough coal for the fire and having to bring it in and heat the house. And they don't want to worry about having to pay bills or anything like that or look after the grounds of their estate. And so what they do is they employ people to do that and they appoint someone who is over all of the household and that someone is their steward. He's their housekeeper. He's the one who makes sure that everything runs smoothly for the family. He was responsible for the management of the family's affairs in that home. He used the family's money to purchase what was needed to pay salaries, to settle bills. He organized all the various tasks that needed to be carried out in order that everything ran efficiently. And he made sure that the tasks that needed to be done were done. He reported to his master of the house at regular intervals. And when he was required to give an account of any aspect of the work that his master had given him, he did so. How many of you watched Upstairs, Downstairs? That's gone back a few generations, isn't it? You remember Gordon Jackson playing Mr. Hudson? Or if you want to bring it more up to date, Downtown Abbey. And Mr. Carson, who was in charge of the people in the bottom of the house. Well, that is a steward. A steward. A position of considerable authority, but more importantly, a position of tremendous responsibility. The steward knew he was handling his master's affairs. And that being the case, he had to be very careful to ensure that he used all of the resources that were entrusted to him wisely and he used them in a way that benefited his master and a way in which his master would approve. He certainly didn't want to be guilty of wasting resources, of shirking responsibility, or of being lazy. The thing about the steward's position that we need to keep very much to the forefront of our mind is that he was entrusted with and put in charge of something that he himself did not own. Someone else's property. And he had to use everything that he had been entrusted with for the good of his master. So that's what a steward is. And as we go on, we'll see the significance of that for us as believers. That brings us, secondly, to ask the question, in what sense then is a Christian a steward? Well, a Christian is a steward in the sense that God has entrusted to the Christian certain things that God expects that person, that man, woman, that young person to use for the glory of God. That which has been entrusted to them is not their own. They don't own what has been given to them. They are the possession of the master, not the steward's own personal possession. They ultimately belong to God. And because they do belong to God, they are to be used in ways of which God approves, in ways with which he is pleased, 
and in ways which will advance his kingdom. We'll be looking in a moment at some of the things that God has entrusted to Christians and which form a part of our stewardship. But before we do that, there are two things that we need to highlight about Christian stewardship. First of all, a steward must recognize his or her responsibility. If a steward is to be a good steward, they must recognize that the resources they have are not their own. Now, most stewards were able to use their master's resources with considerable liberty back in Paul's day. They were able to use their master's finances, and they also did, they always did so, aware of the fact and always recognizing that those finances and all other resources ultimately weren't theirs. They belonged to the master. They couldn't just use them as they pleased. For example, a steward, if the money that was at his disposal was his own, he might have decided to go out and buy himself a new chariot or a new horse or whatever. Or he might have decided to use the money because it was his to take his family away on a, a break down to the Adriatic for three weeks. But the money wasn't his. He wasn't at liberty to use his master's resources to indulge his own personal pleasures. Nor could he use his master's money in a way in which his master would not approve of. Maybe the steward felt it would be wise to invest in some particular project. Maybe the project that he was thinking of was highly profitable, that it was guaranteed almost certainly a very good short-term return. But the problem was that he knew his master, perhaps for personal reasons, wouldn't be happy and wouldn't want to invest in that particular project. Well, the steward, knowing that his master wouldn't be happy with him using his master's resources in such a way, and recognizing that the master's resources weren't his own personal resources, he would not invest in such a project. Regardless of how attractive such an investment would be, no matter of uh, how profitable it might turn out to be, if his master didn't approve of it, he wouldn't use the master's resources in that way. So he had to recognize his responsibility. But as well as recognizing his responsibility, he also had to demonstrate reliability. Reliability. Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4.2 that we read earlier said, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. Or, another translation, trustworthy. Those who employed stewards wanted more than anything else to have complete confidence in their steward. They didn't want to be worrying every day whether or not the steward was doing his job right. They didn't want to be checking up on him every couple of hours to make sure that this was being done, that was being done. They didn't have to want to have to go through their books at the end of every week and their accounts to ensure that the steward wasn't creaming off finances for himself or using finances that had been entrusted to him foolishly, thereby diminishing his master's assets. The sort of steward the master wanted was one whom the master knew he could leave to get on with the job. One that he was fully confident in. One that he could trust. One who was reliable. A steward who was trustworthy, faithful, conscientious. That was the sort of steward that a master wanted. And that's how we as Christians are to exercise stewardship. We're going to see that God has entrusted many things to us which he wants us to use for his glory. The things he has given us 
don't ultimately belong to us. They belong to him. But we have been given them to use with a view to the advancement of his kingdom and the advancement of his glory in this world, to bring glory to the name of God. And in doing that, we're to recognize our responsibility and we're to demonstrate reliability. We're to be the sort of men and women and young people upon whom God can depend. And he knows that we will use the resources that he has given us in ways that he would expect us to use them and with a view to the purpose for which they were given, namely the glory of God. In other words, that we would be reliable stewards of God's gifts. That's all very well as far as general principles relating to the theory of stewardship goes. What does this mean in real, concrete, practical terms? Well, that brings me to the third question I want to ask this evening. What are the areas of stewardship? What areas of your life and of my life does stewardship affect? I was reading a while ago about a young woman who became a Christian, and she was telling some of her friends what a Wonderful difference Jesus Christ had made to her life. She spoke about her church life, her love of the scriptures, how it had changed her attitude at home and in other places. And after listening to her for some time, her friend says to her, but what about the other parts of your life? To which the young woman replied, there are no other parts. Jesus Christ is Lord of the whole of my life. That's a true statement. You can't compartmentalize your life. As Christians, we are stewards of all that we are and all that we have. There isn't a single part of your life or my life that is our own. The Apostle Paul, you remember in 1 Corinthians 6, writing to the Christians there, says, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. You're not your own. Your whole life belongs to God. But lest we lose sight of the specifics by using the language of generalities, let me for a few minutes focus on some of the things to which this is practically applicable. There are many. I'm only going to mention some of them. First of all, God expects me and you, or you and I, to be good stewards of our time. Our time. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, for the days are evil. Now, I'm not going to go into a detailed exposition of that text, but what is clear is that Paul sees time as something that is precious. It's a precious commodity, something that should be guarded and apportioned out with thoughtfulness and consideration and used to its best and fullest capacity. The word that he uses for time here is the Greek word which specifically refers to a season or to a specified body of time. And what he has in view here is our lifespan. Our lifespan. For some, that'll turn out to be 90 to 100 years, maybe. For most of us, somewhere between 60 and 85 years. Perhaps for some here, it'll be a lot shorter. What Paul is saying is that we are to make sure that in the lifespan that God has given us, the amount of time that he 
will grant to us, we use that time for his glory and do not waste it. But the fact is that your 30, 40, 60, 80, 90, or 100 years, whatever it might happen to be, is simply an accumulation of weeks and days and hours and minutes. Every hour that you live is an hour that you cannot get back and use again. You'll be familiar with the name Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, as you know, was a great inventor. Uh, By the time he was 80 years old, he had accumulated 1,000 patents. 1,000 patents. He had been awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics, 1915. He invented the phonograph, the electric light bulb, the microphone, telephone, much more. He worked 18 hours a day. He slept only when he was tired and he ate only when he was hungry. He once said this, time is not a commodity that can be stored for future use. It must be invested hour by hour or else it is gone forever. And the question that I would ask and that we all need to ask is how much of our time are we investing for God? I don't mean by that how many hours do we spend doing door-to-door work or witnessing or reading our Bible or praying, whatever. That, That comes into it. Of course it does. But we also serve God and our good stewards of our time when we apply ourselves with diligence to are God-given tasks and responsibilities. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whether that's farming, whether that's in the office, whether that's in the hospital, in the classroom, whether it's discharging the duties of a wife and a mother in the home, all has to be done to the glory of God, with a view to the glory of God. A God-honoring use of our time. That's good stewardship. But then how do we use the other lumps of time in our daily lives? What we might call our leisure time. Well, it's not wrong to use a proportion of that to enjoy some sort of recreation, whatever recreation that happens to be. But when we take all that into account, surely we have to ask, how much of the time God gives me do I use to serve God? How much time do I give to talking with God in prayer? How much time do I spend learning from God, reading the scriptures? How much of my time do I give to practical ministry to serving in the church of which I am a member and in which God has placed me. When it comes to my leisure time, to the time that isn't taken up with genuine daily tasks and responsibilities that have to be done, how much of that leisure time do I invest in seeking to advance my master's cause. How does the amount of time I give to the things of God compare to the amount of time I spend on my own leisure pursuits? I don't know particularly what it's like in Buck Brickland, although I have some insight, but I know in many congregations, whenever the elders ask people for help for some form of ministry. There'll be those who'll say, I I haven't time. I haven't time. That is a cop-out. An utter cop-out. It's actually a nonsense statement because everybody has the same amount of time. It's not a matter of how much time we have. It's a matter of how we're using that time, what we're investing it in. 
people in general, and sadly, many Christians will spend hours surfing the internet, watching television, chatting online, playing computer games, listening to music. But ask them to give a couple of hours of the week to help with youth ministry. Ask them to give up a Saturday afternoon to take a carload of young people to some youth event. Ask them to come down to go out around the neighborhood doing door-to-door leaflet distribution or to help with maybe a holiday Bible club or whatever else happens to be on. And they'll say, I'm too busy. The time that you have has been given to you by God. It's not your own. And one day, as we're going to see as we come to the close of our sermon in a few minutes, one day we'll be held accountable for how we have used what God has given us, which includes our time. But not only stewards of our time, stewards also of our gifts. Now in Romans 12, verses 3 to 8, the Apostle Paul emphasizes the fact that God has given to every single believer some specific gift or gifts. That's the passage about the body and the arm and the leg and the eye and the ear and so on. And the gift or gifts that God has given to us, he expects us to use for his glory, for the good of his kingdom and the growth of the church. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. Let us use them. Now, we don't all have the same gifts. But every one of you as a Christian has at least one gift. And God expects you to use what he has given. You see that clearly in the parable that we read in Matthew 25. The master, before he went away on a journey, he gave something to each of his servants. And he gave to them according to their ability. In other words, he knew that This man could handle five talents, and this man, well, he could only handle two, and this one could only handle one, and he gave according to their ability. And the master goes away, and they're expected to put to use what they've been given until he comes back. We weren't all given the same, but we're all given something. And in the parable, two of the servants take what the master has given them and they use what was given. And by using what they've been given, they actually gained more for their master. But one of the three didn't do anything with what he had received. He buried it. Didn't put it to use. And he got no return for what he had been given. God has given you a gift, or maybe a number of gifts. Some of you here may be five-talent servants, others may be two-talent servants, others one-talent servants. God isn't concerned about the number of gifts you have, but whether or not you're using the gift that you've been given. Some of you have the gift of friendship. You're brilliant at making friends with people. You're sociable. You click with people. You're great at winning their confidence. And that's a wonderful gift. The gift of friendship has often been used by God to actually bring people into the kingdom of God. It's the first port of call whereby you've begun to establish a relationship with someone and as that relationship builds you then speak to them about the Lord and about the gospel and God uses that to bring another of his elect souls to faith. Many a Christian is a Christian today because when they were unsaved they met and became friends with a Christian who over the months and years witnessed to them. Are you being a good steward of your gift of friendship? Some of you have the gift of hospitality. You open up your home to people. You do so in such a way that the people who are in your home for lunch or tea or whatever feel very much at ease and can relax and find it easy in that environment to talk. 
I was just looking as I came in there, see there's a list now for people offering hospitality to visiting speakers. That's brilliant. I'm glad to see that. It's just a shame there's only a couple of names on it. Some of you have the gift of listening. You're able to lend the listening ear to someone who is perhaps going through a hard time and just wants to unburden themselves. And you're able to listen sympathetically. Maybe give a word of counsel. Some of you have the gift of encouragement. You're like Barnabas. You can say the right word at the right time to bring encouragement to someone. You did that for years with your former pastor. Just the right word at the right time to encourage Mr. Silversides. Maybe you write a letter, or you send a card, or you telephone someone. And it proves that just in doing that, you're really encouraging that person. When they open up that letter or card, or when the phone rings and they answer it, such an encouragement. Some of you have the gift of financial management. Good with figures, able to keep records, pay bills on times, keep on top of monetary matters. Some of you have the gift of singing. You can use that gift in the leading of the praise and the worship of God. You can teach people new tunes. Some of you have the gift of being able to work with young people. You can relate well to young people. And they relate well to you. Some of the tremendous gift of being able to relate well with older folks. And I could go on. There are great gifts that God has given. And you are the steward of whatever gift God has given you. Great organizer, great cook, the gift of generosity. Any amount of different types of gifts that you can be using for the glory of God, the advancement of his kingdom, the building up of his church. Stewards of time, stewards of gifts, and stewards of money. It's a bit of a minefield to go into this particular area, but we'll do it anyway. A lot of people think that the money they have is their own. To use as they please. And the fact is that every last penny that you and I have ultimately comes from God. James tells us every good and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness nor shadow cast by turning. First Chronicles 29 Verses 12 to 14, where they're giving offerings for the house of God. David says this, Riches and honor come of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given. In other words, David says, at the end of the day, Lord, everything that we have comes from you anyway. It's not ours. We believe in tithing. Some people think that once they give God their tithe, that the rest is theirs. Well, it's not. It's still God's. It's all God's. And we're to use our finances wisely for the glory of God. I'm really delighted that years ago our denomination moved away from putting people's names into the financial reports where it showed how much each person or family gave. Totally unbiblical. The good thing is that now the vast majority of us haven't a clue how much anyone gives. But I do know this. In this congregation, you folks give generously. Looking at your annual financial returns. But that might not be the case for 
every single person in the congregation. The question of stewardship of our money challenges all of us. We have to look at our giving to the Lord's work and ask the question, am I honoring God with the stewardship of the financial resources that he has placed in my hands? Do I give to God and to his work what I ought to be giving? Do I really need that new mobile phone? Do I really need that extra suit or skirt? Hey, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with buying clothes and gadgets and stuff. But it's in the context of giving to God. Someone has once said, our giving to the Lord is a matter of right and left. We can give to God what is right, or we can give to God what is left whenever we spend on ourselves what we want to spend. Always remember, God can take away just as easily as he can give. Stewards of time, stewards of gifts, stewards of money, and then fourthly, stewards of the gospel. I'm only just mentioning this because, in effect, I was saying a lot about it this morning. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, that we are stewards of the mystery of the gospel, mystery of God. And it's our responsibility, having been entrusted with the glorious message of the gospel, to use it. We're supposed to be sharing it, investing it in those around us. And the question is, are we doing that? But let me close by asking one more question. Why must I be a faithful steward. And there's many different aspects that we can look at. I want to just think of one. And that comes out of the parable of the talents that we read earlier. You and I must be faithful stewards because there's going to be a day of reckoning. You remember in the parable... The master went away. He gave each of the, student, uh, the stewards something that they were to use. But there was a point when the master returned. And what did he do when he returned? He called each of the stewards before him and says, what have you done with what I gave you? And they had to give an accounting. And the first one came. You give me five, here's five more. Well done. Well done good and faithful servant. He used what God had given him. Second one came, he hadn't been given as much, but what he had been given, he put to use. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. The third one, he'd only been given one talent, not very much at all, but he didn't use it. That was his mistake. He had it, he kept it, he didn't put it to use. And the master says, take what he had and give it to somebody else. And take him and throw him out into the darkness. Why? Because by the way he lived, he was demonstrating that he wasn't a true steward at all. And brethren, there will be a day of reckoning for us. We are saved by grace through faith. But the faith that saves is a faith that works. Works. Works don't save us. But works prove whether or not we are saved. And I assume that every one of you want to hear from the Master's lips, Well done good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Well, the ones who heard that were the ones who put to use what the Master had given to them. Let us use as good stewards what God has given us for the good of our Saviour and the glory of God.
May God bless these thoughts to our hearts. Amen. Our closing psalm is Psalm 131. Short psalm. My heart not haughty is, O Lord, mine eyes not lofty be, nor do I deal in matters not right, one three one. Nor do I deal in matters great or things too high for me. I surely have behaved, behaved myself, myself behaved with quiet spirit and mild. As child of mother weaned, my soul is like a weaned child. Picture here of one waiting upon the master. Upon the Lord let all the hope of Israel rely, even from the, present, the time that present is, unto eternity. We keep our seats as we sing these words in praise. The tune is number 203. Let us worship God together. Not what he is, O Lord, mine eyes separate us with your blessing this evening. Take us to our respective homes safely. And may your grace, your mercy, and your peace be the portion of your redeemed people this night through all of life's journey and then forevermore. Amen.